brats left over from small group yesterday. Well, I'm Curtis Cook, and I came to Bloomington um, to go to IU uh, Graduate School in Music and Voice, and uh, been here for quite a while. Um, gosh, that was back in 92, and um, didn't, didn't know Bob for the longest time during that time, but um, there was a time when... I was away from Bloomington for a while and then came back and um, knew Bob through some other friends and got to know him actually pretty well, went to his house a few times. And um, I remember we, when I first really got to know him, we were involved in this Bible study. Now it was like a sort of an ecumenical Bible study where it was guys from different churches that would meet together. Um, and Bob went, you know, went to, um, Grace Covenant at the time. So, and there was a couple of other guys in that group, um, from Grace Covenant, some from ECC, from, some from, uh, Good Shepherd. And I would take Bob, I would pick him up and take him, uh, in his van to this, you know, to these people's apartments and stuff. And back in those days, um, you know, you got to know Bob pretty well because uh, he was not, uh, he would still function normally. Um, and if he needed to go to the bathroom, he needed to go to the bathroom. And so uh, that was interesting. Now back then, um, also, he could still slightly bear weight on one leg, but it wasn't a guarantee. <laughs> and if you're in a really tight bathroom, wow. So that, that would come in helpful because then you could pivot when you had him up, but then you never knew when those, those knees were going to buckle. And so you still had to have a really good grip on him and then to, you know, put him down on the john. But, uh, so that's when I first got to know Bob. And then it wasn't for several years later when I um, was at a crossroads in life and needed to figure out what to do and where to live. And it opened up to move into Bob's. So I moved into Bob's in 1999. It's a little bit older than your average Bobite moving in for the first time. But at the same time, I think... It, his place really needed somebody to come in that was a little bit more mature and a little bit knew a little bit more how to care for a household because things had kind of gone downhill for a while during that time. So that's pretty much my introduction with getting to know Bob. And oh, and then of course we were, I mean, be, me being a, a, a student, a music student of opera, that was a huge connection early on. Um, oh, wow. So memories start flooding back. So there was also a time before I ever lived with Bob that I was hired by him to come in and sort through his record collection. Now, these days he has the most extensive CD collection anybody's ever seen. But back in those days, he still had a very extension, extensive LP collection. And it just required sorting through figuring out what he wanted to keep, what he wanted to get rid of, and and cataloging everything that he had. And so eventually then we ended up cataloging the CDs as well. Um, that was a long, arduous process that took, you know, quite a bit of time, but I had some time at the time, so was able to come in to Bob's place and do that um, and get to know him a little bit through that. You know, I remember... <laughs> seeing books um, on Yiddish, or this wonderful LP that he had, which was just all some woman, or some, I don't remember if it was a woman or a man or something, it was like a comedy LP, but it was all about Jewishness, and really funny stuff. Um, and so we, we just, early on, little by little, started connecting on things like Verdi and Yiddishkeit and um, stuff like that. What's Yiddish Kite? 
Yiddishkeit, Yiddishkeit, uh, Yiddish, you know, um, that language that kind of mixes German and Hebrew and is Yiddish, you know, oi gewalt, you know, oi nimmer in my ganzes Leben, <laughs> stuff like that, Bob like to say, or, you know, schlemiel. Schlemiel, of course, I'm not going to give you the translation of that word, but it, there's a bazillion words in Yiddish that basically also mean schlemiel, schmuck. Um, anything with schmuck or sh at the beginning of it is probably has its origins in Yiddish. And uh, Bob would just usually just skip right over the Yiddish and just call you a jackass if, you know, but he's, he's known for that. Um, well, yeah, I mean, the love of the love of the German language. So I am, um, I mean, I'm not fluent in German, but I have had a lot of German experience, been in the country multiple times, usually on opera related gigs. And um, yeah, and it's just like, that's just a, a fun point of conversation between somebody who's very open about his Jewishness and and can laugh at himself very well. Actually, that's one of the most... Sorry. <laughs> it's one of the most beautiful things about Bob is his ability to laugh at himself. And um, it's one of the greatest things that has actually, one of the elements that has helped keep him alive and going as long as he has. That and his love for music, his love for learning, his love for the church, um, and his love for people. Okay, sorry, I'm going to have to. No, you're fine. You're fine. <laughs> I didn't foresee this. So Bob's house back in the late 90s was a very different place than it is today, very different. Um, he had this one fellow living there that, honestly, I never saw him anywhere but in this one easy chair in the front room watching football. Um, the house had Berber carpet throughout. It smelled to high heaven especially in the winter when the heat was on. Oh, it was just nauseating almost to be in there. Um, he had this dog at the time. Sorry, I'm talking to the camera. No, you're fine. He had this dog at the time, um, <laughs> Minnie. She was, a, she was a black lab chow mix. But that dog was just too big and too obnoxious, and nobody really ever took ownership of the training of that dog, and that do and she was a nervous wreck. She, she would just pee all over the house, and then in that carpet. So it was it was not a, a pretty scene. When I came into that house, one of the first things I did was relegate that dog to the backyard. And I caught crap from for that move from some of the guys that were there at the time. Um. And then I immediately just started saying, no, this will not do. I mean, the refrigerator that was there at the time was just a joke. All of it's, all of it's in the door, you know, and you've got all those shelves. They were all missing their guardrail type things. And so you couldn't use the entire door of the fridge, right? And... I'm like, Bob, you know, he's, he's, he's from money, he can get a new refrigerator. But ultimately, actually, that kitchen needed to be just redone. I mean, it was outdated, there were these skylights in there that were leaking, and, and nobody was really handling anything in the house. <clears throat> I remember dusting. <laughs> and the next day, there would just be cakes of dust everywhere. And so I would do it again for a while until I really, that I finally realized, oh wow, what are these up here? Return ducts? So I opened them up and it was just insane. The amount of like just hanging dust bunnies coming off those things. So, and then I found another one in the back and it didn't have a filter in it. 
So we ended up having to get a um, professional service to come out and do duct cleaning. And uh, that, was, that was a trip. The man said, I've been doing this for 30 years. And uh, I've only ever seen one job that was worse, and it was a factory. Because it's amazing this place has it caught on fire for the amount of dust that was in that furnace. So how 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 did uh, it get so neglectful? Is that um, is that Bob? Is that the Bobites? Is there was there something missing in the structure? I mean, obviously you are an older guy coming in, so is it just that younger guys are complete morons and don't think about that? But Bob's there, so why is Bob not? So how does it get that bad? In your opinion. I, Bob, I believe he really likes to get, what's the term, go along to get along. And when it comes to certain things in his home, I don't think he's as tight-fisted about certain things as he needs to be. I think he has always been fearful that there's not going to be enough people there to live with them, and so he doesn't want to cause too much of a scene with people and be too, you know, iron-fisted about anything. At the same time, I don't think Bob necessarily has the wherewithal to see his home as an entity that needs to be looked after and cared for and things like, you know, duct filters changed every at least once a year, if not every three to six months, you know. Um, and, you know, with anything, things could be really good for a long time and then start slowly but surely falling apart. But if you've not been on top of it the whole time, you're not going to notice it falling apart until it's too late. And now it's just like, wow, this is a mess. And I think that was the case at the time. We just needed somebody fresh and a little bit self-righteous to get in there and, and get something done. And that was, that was what we did. And I remember also getting a, <laughs> getting a um, carpet cleaner, like vacuum carpet, like the kind that puts down steam. And, and I would just like get the slightest little, like just one strip of rug and have to take that thing and it was just mud and pour it out. So after cleaning all the carpets in there and it not doing too much good with the smell of the place, I don't remember at what point the carpet went away. In fact, no, I wasn't even there anymore when the carpet finally went away. But at least the peeing dog went away. And yeah, so the car, yeah, so the car, that took a long time for the carpets to come out. Now, what did happen while I was there, another project that I was adamant about and had done is Tim, had Tim Wagner come in and assess the bathroom, the main bathroom where Bob, for years, that it was just the saddest thing I've ever seen. They would put Bob, he had the shower stall, but it was like the width of a bathtub. And it just had this like this little lip that you had to like maybe yay tall or so, and you had to put you had to lift him over that and then put him in a metal folding chair with a belt tied around it to help keep him in there, which was a joke. And but I mean he would do that, but I mean, come on, I would hate to have to sit in a cold metal chair to take a shower. So I had that bathroom, I talked it over with Bob. So they went in, expanded the walls in there. They took everything out. You could see the, the ground, you could see the crawl space. Floors were gone, bathroom was gutted. Um, the wall of the, the shower space got expanded about two or three feet, which would have gone into the kitchen, into that laundry nook area. So there was room there to expand that. And then tile was laid in there and it was a roll-in shower, got a PVC pipe, sort of a shower chair to put Bob in, and you could just transfer him into that chair from his wheelchair and then roll him into the shower space. And it was just a much better situation for getting him showered, much more comfortable. Um, 
So there was just things like that over the years. I mean, so earlier on when Bob could bear weight and help in his transfers himself, things like that weren't as necessary. But, you know, with his condition, atrophy is his biggest enemy. And over time, you know, it's not, it's not a progressive disease. It's not even a disease. It's just a condition, um, cerebral palsy. And it's just, I mean, what, what it, how it kills most people is because you lose muscle, you know, and you atrophy over time. And that is affecting your lungs and your breathing and stuff like that. That's why most people um, die from pneumonia with um, cerebral palsy. But anyway, um, he was starting to slow down. He was definitely not bearing weight anymore when you transferred him. And so something else was needed. So that was also something that was done at the time. Now, there was a few other projects that I oversaw <laughs> that didn't go very well, but whatever. Maybe I got a little overzealous, but I also remember, oh, Bob at the time had like seven different subscriptions to mail order DVDs. He would get them constantly in the mail. And that's not, and that's besides when we were constantly going to Borders or Barnes and Noble and buying sacks full of DVDs. I'm not even talking about CD, well, CDs as well. And I just remember thinking, Bob, I mean, you've got piles upon piles of DVDs you've never watched. You know, what's, what, what, what gives? So I kind of got on this mission about, you know, helping him or kind of making him. I don't know. It wasn't the best decision of my life. But, I mean, it's just hard coming into that and just seeing that just vast amount of I mean, I've never, I've never known a collector. I've never lived with a collector. I've, I don't understand the, oh, at the time, I didn't understand the mentality of a, of a collector, you know. And I remember being kind of put in my place by somebody in our church who was a serious collector, saying, well, Curtis, you just don't understand, you know, a collector. This is what you do. I'm like, okay, well, okay. Bob is optimistic. Okay. Well, I mean, he always says things like it could always be worse, and um, he has maintained hope in the Lord, and he just he does not give in to his circumstances, his physical circumstances, um, and it's a fight for him. It's like for all of us, for any circumstance that we are in, but it's it seems... At times with somebody like Bob, it's like magnified. And yet, we look at him and just see how in the world. But from his perspective, it's something he's used to. It's been his entire life. And he just makes the most of it and moves on. Now, it helps that he also comes from um, a family of wealth. And so he has not had to worry about a lot of things that... I think a lot of other people in life have to worry about. Um, and then given the circumstances of your life, being stuck in a wheelchair and and having to rely upon people to look after you, um, I mean, that is a worry point for him. But as far as everything else is concerned, he just really has never had any want for concern over like financial things. Um, Bob, with his optimism and enthusiasm, great enthusiasm, especially for opera, all things opera, a great love for it, would go to the Met two or three times a year, the Metropolitan Opera in, in New York, would go up to Chicago Lyric Opera, I went with him up there one time. We saw um, Macbeth, Verdi's Macbeth, and it was amazing. Bob and I both still talk about that to this day, and that was 20-some-odd years ago. Um, but, wow. <laughs> oh. <laughs> 
Flip side belligerent. Oh, wow. I mean, try to come alongside Bob and say, maybe don't buy so many of these today. And boy, you could get it. You know, he would tighten up in the chair and just... I mean, that was his way of yelling at you because he couldn't quite get that out, you know, verbally. He would just get really, really mad if, if you tried to help him, help discipline himself with some of his um, extravagant shopping habits. There was also uh, his inability or his, his lousy in instruction giving when driving in cities and stuff that you, you didn't know yourself. And this is before GPS and all that stuff. And so you're like, Bob, do I need to be in the right lane or the left lane? Bob, do we have any turns coming up? Do I need to be in the right lane or the left lane? He's like, you're fine, you're fine. And, <laughs> and then you're like driving along, like, okay. And then he's like, Argh. I'm like, what? You were supposed to turn back there. I'm like, Bob, that would require me to have been in the left lane. You know, um, that would require you to have told me there's a turn coming up. You know, so those things, you know, he just didn't think about because he was the one behind the driver's seat, never was. Um, in a way, I mean, you know, he was behind the driver's seat the whole time, but, <laughs> um, but it wasn't actually the one doing the driving of the vehicle. It wasn't the one actually having to take him to all the stores to buy all the CDs and all that stuff. Um, so, I mean, life with Bob can be very fulfilling, but also very frustrating. And the frustration didn't come so much in the self, in the, in the, in the caring for his body. The frustrations definitely came in the caring for just Bob, his, his personality, his character, his, his habits. And I mean, that's, that's how it is with all of us and the things that get in the way with most of us anyway. And there I say with him, you know, it's just all, it's all seems to be, it's all more acute because when you're living with Bob and looking after Bob, it's all about Bob. And, um, yeah, so it's, it all goes with the, so one of the best things that I experienced while living at Bob's. I don't know, I've talked about the house, the needing repairs, and this and that, and the third. But Bob had a great love for food and really diverse, interesting cuisine. He loved to go to the finest restaurants in New York and, you know, for what it's worth, Bloomington even. Um, What's that supposed to mean? Yeah, well, there's not really, you know, the same caliber of restaurant in Bloomington as in New York. Taco Bell. Yeah. <sighs> Sorry. Right. Um, and not to poo-poo on the guys that were living there at the time, but there was just the cuisine had just gone downhill. And it, the same guys are just making the same silly dishes and not really putting forth the effort and Bob was just dealing with it and whatever. It's food, you know, it'll eat. But he had all these cookbooks. And I, you know, I mean, my name obviously is Curtis Cook, so at some point I had to fulfill my destiny of my name. And it was there at that house where that really started to come into fruition. I would have huge amounts of time working with Bob and with basically nothing else to do if we weren't out shopping. So um, I owned in on some cooking skills. And now Bob loved to sit in his wheelchair in the kitchen and watch you cook. It's one of his absolute favorite things. And the more enthusiastic about it you were, the more... Um, adventurous you were with it. I mean, he just loved it. 
And so and then you talk through it. You're like, oh, we, we need some garlic in this, Bob. Oh, yeah, garlic, you know. Oh, and oh, we would, would watch these cooking shows together. You loved this show. We both loved the show, The Two Fat Ladies. And there was this one episode where one of them says, oh, you've always, always got to have a lot, of, a lot of garlic with pork. Pork loves it. Oh, Bob, that's, that's the funniest line ever. And he's always been saying ever since then, well, pork loves garlic. <laughs> so I remember making all sorts of really great dishes, um, often from the two fat ladies cookbooks that we would get, um, but also from these other cookbooks that he had. He had this French cookbook. I never forget making this cassoulet. I never even heard of a cassoulet. It called for three different kinds of meat, and they were usually like game kind of meat and rabbit and stuff. And at the time, there was just no access to that, and we didn't know people raising rabbits and all that good stuff. So you kind of had to make your substitutions. But that kitchen, I had it a complete mess. It was an all-day process. And that evening, we had some friends over of, of mine and Bob's, um, Don and Adam Spady. And her father was visiting at the time, so he came as well. And this was when they were, I don't even know if they, they were married yet or if they were still engaged. It was quite a while ago, I don't recall. Um, but <laughs> that was a very good dinner party. And I never forget Adam at the end <laughs> licking the pot, you know, or with his finger or whatever, because of that, that cassoulet was just so delicious. And I mean, it was all because of that recipe and me following it meticulously. But that was a highlight, you know. There was this other meal, i never forget. And I had labored all day with it. And I don't know if it was a, a bouffe bourguignon or if it was like this amazing fish pie, which sounds gross, but it was delish. Um, but I, I, at the end, I threw in a little dessert. It was just one of those silly um, dump cakes where you just take a box of cake mix, a stick of butter, and a can of fruit pie filling, cherry pie filling. Dump it together, mix it around, bung it in the oven, come out, serve it with a little vanilla ice cream to cut the sweetness, you know. And I never forget, Andy Halsey was living there at the time. And Andy had this bowl of this stuff and the spoon and was just in this position the whole time eating it slowly and moaning and going oh Curtis oh I know this is a sidetrack this isn't about Bob but that was one of the funniest memories of my gosh I slaved all damn day long over this thing, and I've just made this stupid little dessert. And this is what you're going on and on about. Come on, give me a break. But nonetheless, that were some of the fun times there. Um, the other fun times with other guys that lived there at the time with Anthony Moore, he and I. Bob, to this day, says Anthony was the most annoying guy he ever lived there. But, I mean, Bob loved him, and Anthony worked really well with him. It's just he could get a lot obnoxious at the time. It was one of my favorite quotes. Bob was in, on this kick of really watching a whole lot of um, Touched by an Angel. Mm. Quality TV there. And Walker, Texas Ranger. That was another show he liked a lot. And so Anthony would say, Bob, are you in there watching Tux Touched by a Texas Ranger again? <laughs> Ah, uh, that was good. How did Bob respond to that? Yes, yes. Usually, his typical response, you know. I also loved it when Bob would get mad at you and he would hit you, which would just be this real slow, the arm would go over and just kind of land on your arm. And that would be his, a hit, you know. But... Now, there are some other stories I've got about Bob that are funny. Some of my favorite stories ever, actually, about Bob. 
One, I was, there was one Thanksgiving, I believe, where he didn't have plans with family or anything. He often did. He would actually usually go up, I think, to Chicago and spend Thanksgiving with his cousin Fran. Um, but for that, some reason that year, that wasn't going to work out. And I was going to go down to my sister's with my whole family. They were going to go over from, from Arkansas over into North Carolina, where my sister was living at the time. And I'm like, Bob, do you want to go? down there with, you know, we could do that. And I checked it out with them. I'm like, sure. So Bob and I went down in his van. And uh, his van, oh, that's just a whole other subject altogether. The vans, because the vans were always breaking down. Something was always going wrong with those vans. The stupid ramp was always breaking, you know. Um, or, or the van would just break down in the most random times. Well, of course, the van broke down on the way down to North Carolina, right outside Lexington, Kentucky. So we had to be towed and stayed in a hotel that night. But you can't put Bob in the tow truck. So I stayed in the van with Bob, and we looked at the sky as we were being towed into the nearest town. And, uh, and that was interesting. That was a fun time. But thankfully, they were able to get the van fixed, and we went on down to North Carolina and had Thanksgiving with my family. And they all got to know Bob a little bit for that one brief day or two. But that night, after being in that chair all day long, this happened every night when you put Bob to bed, to finally get that body out of that wheelchair and laid out flat in that bed, and at the time, so they talk about nowadays having to do the flip. At the time, there was no the flip because Bob could still turn himself over in bed. But, you, but it was still a, a routine. You, you positioned him in one position on his side, and then at some point during the night, he would turn onto his back, and that would be his two sleeping positions for the night. But it was something he was capable of doing himself, and, and so, you know didn't need someone to get up in the middle of the night to help him do that. But putting him on his side, and my sister had given him, I think, one of his daughter or one of her daughter's rooms or something. There was hardwood floors and hardwood everything, and we were in there getting him all, I was in there getting him all settled and ready for bed. And when I rolled him onto his side, Bob let out a fart that could be heard around the world. It was long, it was beautiful. And it was loud. And so I'm like, wow, Bob, impressive, you know. Good one, good one. But when I came out, <laughs> I finally had them all tucked in and everything, came out of the bedroom. My sister was standing out in the hall. She's like, everything okay? I'm like, yeah. She goes, Curtis, what was that noise? And I explained what it was, and she just kind of giggled and... And it's just a fond memory. I remember telling that story at one of Bob's big birthday bashes a few years ago when the whole room burst out into tear-laden laughter. Um, there was another time, though, when Bob and I went to this Chinese restaurant in town. He liked to go to. We went there for lunch. And the little waitress came over. She was a little you know, Chinese woman. And she, she was about as tall as Bob was sitting in his chair. And it was at the end of the meal. And so I was sitting on the inside, and he was on the outside, because you always fed Bob from his left side, right? I believe so. Yeah. No. No, from his right side. Oh, that's right. So we were that way. Anyway, yeah, correct. Always fed Bob from his right side. But he was on the, on the outside of the table. And <laughs> when she came over to ask how everything was, Bob just turns to her and belches right in her face and she was like oh mm, okay mm, and sort of scanders off I'm like good one Bob I love that one that's another favorite and you can sort of see her hair go back a little bit from the air of the burp um, my two favorite funny Bob stories there I've said them those are good um so, several years ago, Bob, I don't remember how many years ago this was now, but Bob had a whole series of health problems that were pretty serious. 
um, he started having bed sores and started having respiratory issues. And at some point, I think he was in the hospital for a second or third time. And he was in an induced, I don't know if he was in an induced coma, but he was completely asleep when I went in to visit him. Um, it was a time where I was going through some other stuff and I could not bear the thought of losing Bob. Just could not handle it at all. Um, and I never forget going up into his hospital room and being in there with him, you know, just by ourselves. He was completely asleep or, or, or out of it. I don't know if he was there again. I don't know if he was an induced, I think it was an induced sleep. And I talked to him for a little while and then I prayed over him and I just pleaded with God to not take him yet. I just I couldn't handle it. And thankfully God answered that prayer and Bob sprung back and he sprung back quite well. Um, even though I lived with Bob back in 99 to 2001, I've, I'm still, I've always gone over there Maybe not as often as I should, but I still go over there. I always pop in on Bob. I usually try to be um, of some semblance of an influence on some of the guys that are living there, give a pointer here and there when I can, or where I see something, um, you know, not going right. Like just recently, <laughs> I had to address those, those um, vents again. They weren't getting changed, the filters. But, I mean, it's not me going over there and like, you all need to get this place in line, you know. But um, ever since I've known him, he's, he's definitely been a very good friend and a very inspiring person in my life. Um, there have been other times when there was one specific time, it was at church, I pulled him aside, I took him into the little library and talked to him. I'm like, Bob, how do you do it sometimes? Because I mean, myself, I, I get too caught up in my head, I get too caught up in my circumstances, and I get really depressed. And I'm like, I've got to talk to Bob because Bob's the only person I think that can give me some advice, you know? And honestly, I don't remember what the advice was at the time, but. It was good, and I reflect back on that often. And um, that's just one of the wonderful things about knowing Bob. I mean, he's just, there again, that optimism, that joie de vivre, that drive to just keep living regardless of what's thrown at you. It's just very, I mean, I hate to use the word inspirational, but that's what it is. It's just a really good example of someone living in faith, I think. And um, and not giving in to self-pity and those other things that trap some of us sometimes. So there's that, there's that chapter. <laughs> so at the time I lived there, there were five people. How long? As and there was that front room with two beds or a bunk bed. And then the back room with the bathroom in it, on it. Um, and then there was that back corner room and that was my room. Cause I was kind of like the house manager dude at the time. Mm. And it was my little groove room, you know. Now, for one thing, Bobite is a term that has happened over the years since I lived there. We weren't called Bobites. Yeah, when I did, think that's a really know, strange Do you know when thing. that term was coined? I don't know when that term was coined. Okay. But you were not called Bobites, so you just were like the dudes who lived at Bob's house. 
Yeah, okay. just caregiver for Bob or whatever. But it is a thing now. It is I mean, a thing. It has been for 10 years at least. Cause, I mean, that's what we were... It was like, it was a very clear, this is a thing. It's called a Bobite. Well, at some are. point, it became kind of a mission field for our church. But prior to that, it never was. I mean, it was... Well, when did it, he when did required his guys that lived there to be Christians. But he did not require anybody to be of any particular certain denomination or anything like that. So we would often have people from various and sundry churches or different faiths living there. Well, he still doesn't require that. Occasionally, he has had non-believers live there. Um, but, it, you know, it's after an interview process and sort of an agreement on, you know, a, a, a type of character. Um, but, I, I mean, I think early on, his, his whole point of having Christians live there was that he had just found over time that they're more trustworthy and, um, and better, you know, workers and whatnot. However, it's not always the case. There's definitely been several Christians, upstanding good Christian folks that I've known over the years to live with Bob and just not work out. They're just not of the caliber of a good, of that type of thing, you know. What's your first impression of Bob? you can remember I don't really remember honestly I think I might have seen him peripherally you know on the side of the aisles or whatever at certain performances that I might have been in um, or that I might have attended while I was in school at IU um, but I didn't notice him at everything because with most things, there would be multiple performances of each thing. So, I mean, but other people would see him all the time at stuff. And and then I just remember Dawn saying, oh, certainly you know Bob. You've, you've seen Bob, right? I mean, he's always at the productions and at the concerts and stuff. And always, want, you know, and you're just, you know, bubbling about Bob and how funny he is and all this kind of stuff. And, and not knowing him and really not even anything. I was just like, oh, okay, well, good. You know, I, and I don't honestly remember when I first met him. But it would have been in 96, 95, 96, somewhere in there, when I moved back to Bloomington. I'd, like I said earlier, I'd been away for a while. And I, um, which was during that same time when I first knew y'all. And that's when Anthony and I lived on Atwater. And so in that the wasn't yellow house. in that yellow the house, yeah. Hamsters, whatever. <laughs> With his hamster. And Gina was around. And Gina would be around. It was our little grad school church music student hangout. Andrew Dion, Molly Markowski, Dawn, Gina. We'd all that was just sort of the hangout. Very convenient to the music school. But just a few blocks down from Bob just a couple of blocks down from y'all. Um, so it was sometime during that time when I first got to know Bob, like, like I said, so there was that group, there was the college group at ECC called the Sojourners. But when I came to, back to Bloomington, the whole split had just happened. And so... And I really was not a part of ECC before I had left Bloomington for that year. So when I came back, all of a sudden, a, sort of a core group of friends, basically led by Don, Don and I were really close for years, um, we're, we're going to that new church, you know, Good Shepherd. And so I just went right along, you know. And, um, but of course, Bob wasn't going there at the time. But then there was that men's group, and so Andrew Dion and Anthony Moore and Nate Baxter and a few other guys. There was about seven of us all together. And Bob, I mean, Bob, I think, was among the seven. And we would meet at various and sundry people's apartments or living places. And then eventually we got, I'm like, this is ridiculous. Let's just meet at Bob's. You know, we'd meet in Bob's bedroom. Um, and we had a really good, it was a tight group, even though we were, went, the group of us went to three, if not four different churches 
Uh, so it was a really unique, interesting, and it was, that's when I really got to know him. And there again, I got to know him because I would be the one to take him to the bathroom. But I wasn't living with him yet. You know, that wasn't even an option for me. I didn't even see that as something that I might do um, until kind of the time came where I'm like, oh, maybe I should do this and talk to him and, and moved in there. Well, I'll just get back into, I mean, that's just pre-Bob information, but when Dawn came to school, her first, our first, the first opera of that season, that fall, was abducted from, from the Seraglio, and Dawn and I were both in it, and so we got to know each other through that, and we really got to know each other through a car ride together up to a vocal competition in Indianapolis at, I think, Butler or somewhere, and... And in that car ride, it was discovered that we were, you know, because I'm going to forget Don saying, you know, I think we're kindred spirits, aren't we? <laughs> and I'm like, well, whatever you mean by that. She goes, you're a Christian, aren't you? I'm like, yeah. I believe I am. <laughs> she goes, no, I think you are. <laughs> you know, because uh, I really wasn't on that path at that time, but had been, you know, earlier in life and feeling through it in undergrad and grad school and all that stuff. So it was through a, a series, series of life's events and God putting people in my life that got me back in gear. And eventually Bob was in that picture. So it was very natural. I mean, just the way I got to know him was just like I would get to know anybody. It was a slow, gradual process. It wasn't just all of a sudden, hey, I'm friends with Bob. You know, it was like, do this, do that, take him here, take him there, get to know him a little bit, learn how to talk with him, you know. Now, I will say, I mean, early on in life, I had, I've I've always had a soft spot for people with disabilities. Now, to me, that was just knowing a handful of people growing up that had Down syndrome, for instance. And I knew right away with Bob that that was not the case, that he was mentally all there. And I understood that. I had never known anybody with cerebral palsy firsthand, first, you know, first known them myself. Um, but, you know, there again, I mean, unlike a lot of Bobites who get to know Bob because they move in with Bob, they take that gig, per se. I knew him for three or four years before choosing to move in and look after him myself. So, I think that was a slightly different scenario than, than most, you know. Um, and honestly, when it came time to move out, I mean, it was just time that I should move out anyway, but I had, because of my care for Bob, because of my, this inward thing of like caregiving, I ended up taking a job working as a CNA at a nursing home. And eventually, after about six months of that, working all day with wheelchairs and coming home to one, it was too much. I had to get out of there. And I was 31 at the time. It's a little old for Bob's house. So he really decided that it was time to move on, and I moved on, and that was that. But like I say, I mean, I continued to pop in over there, sometimes to the annoyance of the guys that lived there. Um, and remain a part of his life even so even after he started coming to our church but it wasn't just because of that it was because I'd already established a relationship with Bob and done things with him even after I lived with them I had already I still took them I wasn't working with him or anything but would work with him by helping being one of the, you know the second guy to take him on a trip to New York or or to meet up with somebody that was in New York, um, you know, maybe somebody would take him to New York, like Dan Bubeck would take him up to New York, and then I would go up, fly up, relieve Dan, 
and then drive him back to Bloomington, stuff like that. So, I always forget that Dan lived with them. All right. That's it. Well, thank you. It's been real. Now I'll be interested to see what tiny little blurb <laughs> makes know. it into your I know. film. Hey, so do you like documentaries in general? No. You don't? No. So have you seen Vernon, Florida? Yes. Is that the chicken one? The chicken no, one or the turkey Florida. one? Vernon, Florida. By who? I don't know if it's by Herzog or not. Is it the one with the chickens? I don't remember or the chickens. The turkey. The turkey guy. The he's, guy with like all the turkeys. No. He, oh, he's got he's got the turkey legs and tails on a little plaque. I feel his, like I have seen his it. pink trailer and he's sitting there talking about Woo In terms of other sort of Bobites, I'd say you'd have to look at the OG uh, Bobite as Curtis Cook. Mm -hmm. And I think Curtis Cook really um, he never, in a way, also never left Bob's house. Curtis would always be coming to use the computer at night after his shifts uh, working at the nursing home and continuing to sometimes cook for Bob, um, hang out at the house with the guys, bring over a six pack of beer at times and just hang out. And, and um, you know, Curtis, I think more than anyone else when I was there, clearly understood Bob and understood his humor and Curtis would shift into this Jewish mother sort of sing-songy voice when he would talk to uh, Bob and I don't know why but it was always extremely funny to me. I always found him to be one of the funniest guys in terms of interacting with Bob. But the fact that he was always just kind of keeping an eye on things, just sort of keeping watch maybe in the same way that Lucas was, was really cool to watch.